the OPC and the URC. You URC guys love to be called reverend. I don't, God is reverend, I'm not. You can call me Bill or call me pastor, but that's a... <laughs> now, uh, I have a handout for all of you, so what I want you to do, I don't like having to um, speak against your derrieres. You're all tired from a long day today, so why don't you stand up while you uh, take two sheets. You're each going to want uh, two sheets. One, you talk about a wonderful juxtaposition of names, John Calvin and John Galbraith. So you need to have uh, two sheets that have their names on them and move around a little bit and so on. Thank you, my friend. Our Lord, we are thankful that you know our frame, that we are but dust. And we are thankful that we know that we're many words are, sin is not absent. We know that when we have long times to pay attention and engage our minds and our hearts, we become weary. But Lord, let this be an encouragement to all that what we discuss regarding ecumenicity on the local level, on the international level, and every level in between is indeed a tremendous blessedness from your own hand. We ask for extra measures of the Spirit now as we meet in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, my dear brothers and sisters, I have been asked to be the Joel Osteen of this conference. <laughs> Reverend Mercy, Murphy called me, and he said, Bill, we want you to end this conference and motivate us to ecumenicity. So I will smile amply to this group as the Joel Osteen seeking to motivate you to ecumenicity, but I really I'm very, very honored to have, uh, not only be able to speak, but, uh, but have that role. Let me give you a little bit of my experience. Um, this is my 35th year of ordained ministry. Uh, it's amazing. I've been in the same church, I think it's still in existence, the same church for 33 years in Franklin Square, New York, and it has been a tremendous blessing. And my whole background, in many ways, has been ecumenical. Um, I was converted when I was a senior in, in high school and immediately, or when I was in college, became part of a Reformed Presbyterian Church, Evangelical Synod, which is now part of the Presbyterian Church in America. When I attended Westminster Seminary, we attended an OPC that was in many ways a lot like the good old days of the Christian Reformed Church, and that's where I did my internship, and even for a while, my wife and I entertained the thought back in the 1970s of going into the CRC, but I did have to change my last name to Vandershish and I didn't think that would work out all that well for that. Uh, my first pastor was in the RPCES. I was told it was interestingly by one of the ministers at that time, I, I think he'd be a whole lot happier in the OPC, and uh, that's where we ended up in 1981 in Franklin Square. Uh, a number of the things that Brother Bill had mentioned we've been able to do on, on the local level in Franklin Square. I've had the privilege of serving for some years in the 1980s on the Committee on ecumenicity and interchurch relations for the OPC. Interesting time, it was the time that we actually finally broke off our ties with the Christian Reformed churches, and at almost the same time, uh, we had the privilege after a 50-year alienation of having a meeting with a representative from the Bible Presbyterian Church who met with us during that time, and we also were thrashing through many issues connected with a, a so-called join and receive with the Presbyterian Church in America. In my previous presbytery in New York and New England, um, I was chairman of the um, Fraternal Relations Committee, and uh, I can appreciate what Brother Bill mentioned. There weren't a lot of men in that area from Napart churches, but it was always a joy to have some there or attend their presbyteries or classes meetings and learning experiences they were. And one of the reasons I mentioned that is this blessing of ecumenicity that I'm going to speak with you about, I have seen it. Felt it. I have tasted it, and like Brother Bill before and the previous speakers, I love that. My commitment as I speak to you today, as I deal with the subject, I am an unembarrassed biblicist. I believe what the Bible says is true, and there is no doubt that the Bible speaks in so many ways about seeking visible unity among the brethren. And I am an ever hopeful biblicist because I am a post-millennialist. I tell people I have to keep being a post-millennialist ministering in New York, if for no other reason than to keep my sanity, which begs the question of whether I still have it. But that brings a constant optimism despite the challenges, 
Um, I believe there's going to be progress in these areas. I'm optimistic. And brothers and sisters, there really is blessedness, as you're going to learn in the work of practical ecumenicity. So, now this I guess I can do, since I have a little bit of seniority on many of you in here. I have, for my own kind of small head, changed in my own mind the, the, the headings of the four talks so I could wrap my head around them. Number one is the biblical case. Number two, the barriers. Number three, I call the byway. A little traveled road is the byway. And number four, the invitation to ecumenicity I have changed to the blessedness of ecumenicity. And I hope it will be inviting to you. Here's what we're going to do. Number one, the psalm that invites us to ecumenicity. Number one, the psalm that invites us to ecumenicity. Number two, the blessedness of life in this true unity. The blessedness of life in this true unity. And number three, how I learned and will never forget this beauty. All righty, here we go. Turn to Psalm 133. I'm using the ESV. I think that's acceptable. And the URC as it is in the OPC as well. Psalm 133, a song of ascents of David. Behold, how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell in unity. It is like the precious oil on the head running down the beard, on the beard of Aaron, running down on the collar of the robes. It is like the dew of Hermon, which falls on the mountains of Zion. For there, and notice this, this language, there the Lord has commanded the blessing, life forevermore. This is part of the Song of Ascents that begins with Psalm 120 and ends with Psalm 134, uh, probably depictions of the various stage or stages of the pilgrimages of the tribes of Israel making their way to Jerusalem for a time of united worship. And it's interesting that the Song of Ascents, beginning with Psalm 120, is about strife, and it's about war, and it's about division. It's the psalm that ends with these words, I am for peace. But when they speak, they are for war. And then in Psalm 133, as this pilgrimage progresses, you read the word, Behold, stop and think about just the opposite, the goodness and the pleasantness of brethren dwelling in unity. And it is no coincidence that the the songs of ascents ending in Psalm 134 are a beautiful fanfare of the worship of these people who have gone from strife and warfare to being together. And that word behold is significant. I'm convinced that the word behold or that little term that's used in the Psalms, selah, may be the most important biblical words for us in our day. Because as we think of all of these things to do that are good things, we realize Uh, that we are so frantic and so busy and we stop so little that very often, if we're honest, these challenges to how we can accomplish ecumenicity come to us and we just breathe harder. Another thing to do. Behold, like a selah, stop and think about this. And brothers and sisters, whatever else this conference accomplishes, it's this. It makes us stop and think about the beauty of this thing called biblical ecumenicity. Notice that it is a blessed thing. Behold how good and pleasant it is when brothers dwell together in unity and all of the language culminating and there the Lord has commanded the blessing is the language of blessedness. And that is our most compelling invitation to biblical ecumenicity. In it, there is the way, there is the path, there is the atmosphere of blessedness. Why, even Joel Osteen would be thrilled to hear that language of blessedness that's given here. And commentators have rightly pointed out that this blessedness is on every level. 
it on the family level. There's blessedness when we and our children and spouse are dwelling together in unity or in the state or in the nation, but of course particularly here in the church or Israel as we would know it. And speaking as one person put it, of unity of place, of race, and of grace. And notice it's a unity that must begin at the top. It's like precious oil on the head running down on the beard, on the beard of Aaron, or it's like the dew of Hermon, you can try to figure which of the two Hermon mounts this is, which falls on the lower mountains of Jerusalem. It is a blessedness that begins at the top and runs down. It's like oil that runs down on the beard or that runs down on the collar of the robes or same word which rain comes down on the mountains of Zion. And of course, this is supremely in and from Christ. In John 17, the unity that, that you, Father, and I have and have had from the foundation of the world, that they might know these things, that they might be one, even as you and I, Father, are one. And of course, as Jesus, as you know, is supremely greater than Aaron is, and the blessing flows from him. Notice, this isn't really an achievement. I wonder, brothers and sisters, if we haven't hurt ourselves by looking at ecumenicity more as a blessing from God, less as a blessing from God than as an achievement that we are to somehow gin up by our own efforts. Now both are in view. God is 100% sovereign, man is 100% responsible, but this is a blessing. And it's a blessing that begins by communion with Christ who is the head because the closer you are to him, the less comfortable you will be with disunity with any who call on the name of the Lord out of a pure heart. If our unity flows from that unity of the Son and the Father and the Spirit, and then the way we have the heart of that unity is by being in communion with him. Without any doubt, the most agonizing vote I have ever had to make at a General Assembly of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church was in 1986. It was the 50th anniversary of the OPC, and it was, in God's providence, the year that we were to vote on something called J and R, join and receive. I still have in my notes that it was to the minute, 24 hours, although we did break for dinner and for rest, but 24 hours as the clock goes from the time the debate began until we had the ballot vote in 1986. I voted against the join and receive proposal and I did it with tremendous anguish because on the one hand, you had before you what seemed like a way in which organizational unity could bring a witness of this blessedness to the world. But in my view, and I still maintain that view is right, that method, that procedure, which was a corporate business model, would in the long run, I believe, have been absolutely counterproductive to true ecumenicity. But here you have this, in the midst of all of this, what I agonized with was how much of this was pride, personal or denominational? How much of this was just tradition, denominational, national? How much of it was resentment of the Presbyterian Church in America? And while I still believe that the vote I made was right, it came with much anguish because in the midst of all of it, there was the battle with a sin to keep a close communion with God, even as you were making a decision that was so difficult. But here, that unity begins at the top. It runs down. Now on earth, it must always begin with the leaders of the church. In the handout that I've given to you, the John Calvin section, he, Calvin speaks of men of learning. He says in that second paragraph, the third line, if men of learning conduct themselves with more reserve than seemly, the very heaviest blow 
attaches to the leaders themselves who either engrossed in their own sinful pursuits are indifferent to the safety and entire piety of the church or who individually satisfied with their own private peace. Ecumenicity is hard. It's difficult. It's upsetting. Have no regard for others. And then later he speaks of the need of adjusted, look at the language, adjusted agreement between men of learning upon the rule of Scripture, which is, of course, necessary. However you want to understand this, the unity on earth must begin with the leaders of the church. And that, brothers and sisters, will never come to minds and hearts that are full first of debate and difference. If you're in a church body in which two officers split from one another because they differ on how to pronounce their last name, you realize you are quite far away from realizing this kind of unity is mentioned in here. But rather for minds and hearts full of the love, the long-suffering, the patience, the kindness, and the goodness of God, even as the priest was to represent that supremely in Christ, so leaders must represent that as the ground for all healthy ecumenicity. Notice, brothers and sisters, this is messy stuff. Oil coming down on the beard of Aaron, running down on the hem or the collar of his garments. That's messy stuff. Most of you wouldn't like a lot of oil dumped on your head and then coming down your face, and going down your shirt and your, or your blouse to the bottom. It's messy stuff. But it's messy stuff that is accompanied with God's blessing. One of our elders is fond of saying when we deal with difficult things, the agony is part of the answer. The messiness of working through ecumenic, ecumenical relations is part of the answer, but that messiness brings blessing to every member. It goes down throughout the garment, and that dew goes to the very base of the mountains of Zion and causes lush, lush plants to grow. It's a pleasant thing. And that language of pleasant in verse 1 has been used for the language of instruments that are playing together in what we would know of today as an orchestra. The pleasantness of, of various instruments and even various types of sounds in those instruments that are in concert together, all playing as they ought to, none of them out of tune, and all responding to the leadership of the great conductor. Pleasant is that kind of a beauty that is here. Now that means sometimes believers are going to agree to disagree and may need to go different ways. And we need to realize the Bible gives illustrations of that. The first you can think of is Abraham and Lot, in which Abraham gives the better portion to Lot. And they must go their separate ways. And most striking, I think, is in the New Testament, after the first synod or the first assembly, where you would expect that there would be wonderful concord. And Paul and Barnabas separate from one another over the issue, apparently, of the usefulness of John Mark. And the Holy Spirit doesn't mask that. It's put right in that section Y to teach us that there will be times that believers must agree to disagree and go different ways. But don't ever be satisfied with that. Now, that same Holy Spirit who authored that, authored at the very end of Philemon. You could miss it if you read it too quickly. The Apostle Paul saying, John Mark is, he is again with me, and he's useful for me in the ministry. But see, even the Holy Scriptures in these areas invite us to a reality, and yet a reality that's sometimes sad, uh, but that should never be the end the end or the last word. And then notice also in Psalm 133, in this beautiful symphony of true brotherly unity. Verse 3, there, in that 
place, in that way, in that environment, God commands the blessing, which is life evermore. Not individual regenerate people, though that would be included in this. Not just new births in that narrow sense. But it's the richness that Jesus speaks of when he says, I've come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. If you by the Spirit do put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's not the way you're going to be justified. You'll experience the greatest blessedness in that battle with remaining indwelling sin, in that way, you will learn something of the life that is abundant that Jesus has brought for us. And there is the heart of the invitation to ecumenicity in our culture. I don't need to convince you that our culture is dying at a very, very rapid rate. As painful as it is for us to think of this individually or as ministers to tell congregations, we are seeing played out before our eyes the, the last part of Romans chapter 1 in which God gives people over to a culture of death. When you have 35 states in the United States allowing ratifying the ratification of so-called same-sex marriage, you spell that given up. And that means death. The greatest invitation to ecumenicity, brothers and sisters, is that in the context of healthy, biblical, principled ecumenicity, there's life, just what the culture needs. And, and I think it's helpful our New York Jewish friends have got the concept right. Paul, you'll be able to relate to this. You have your toast, and it's l'chaim, to life, to the blessedness of life. And that's really what's in view. The writer says the, the invitation to ecumenicity is the blessedness of life. And that brings us to, in the second place, the blessedness of life in this true unity. And here I'm not at all taking away the challenges and the difficulties. These have been presented very well by Dr. Strange today. But I want you to let the blessings eclipse the challenges for a little bit. Let's, let's do that. Let's do it l'chaim, to life. Here the Lord commanded the blessing, l'chaim, life forevermore. What's the life, the blessed life, that comes in the development of biblical ecumenicity on whatever level? Number one, l'chaim, to lives of humility that come by having to work together as a family. The blessedness of the humility that comes by having to work together as a family. Thank God our biological families are not like our ecclesiastical families. They'd be spread all over the place. But the blessedness that the Lord gives when there's true humility is it makes us realize ecclesiastically we need to work together as a family. It's the humility of being able to say, my preferences are not the same as convictions. Can you say that? I got a little bit of seniority here. In many cases, ecumenicity has been stopped for one reason, because we make convictions out of our personal preferences, rather than be humble enough to say they're not necessarily equal. Our background is not equal to the Bible, and that's a very humble thing to admit whether it be Dutch or whether it be Scottish or whether it be American Presbyterian or whether you've come, as I have, from a countercultural background to the Lord, your background is not in any sense equal to Bible, and that brings humility. Traditions are not equal to the Scriptures. 
And the only way to get over those hurdles in a right way is by this thing called humility. Look at Ephesians 4 and verses 1 through 3. We've alluded to this, but notice the, the, the words and the language here. I therefore a prisoner for the Lord. Even out of my prison, I don't think first of my imprisonment, but this, I urge you, I implore you, I, I encourage you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called with all humility. Augustine had it right. The three most important graces of the Christian life. Humility, humility, and humility. With all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love, eager, spudazzo, working hard, making every effort to maintain the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. That's humility. Because in a family, if you're going to keep a family together, you must work through your differences. You want to have family reunions where people come together not with swords and with spears, but with grace and with love. You've got to work through differences. And it's hard, and it takes humility, and you've got to know where to bend and where not to. Any of you with relatively large families, we have six children, you know what this is. But to my fellow ministers and elders, aren't we supposed to learn from our families uh, that it's not just the local church, but with all who call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, we work to see unity, not least with those who have substantially the same confessions. L'chaim, the lives of humility, the blessedness of lives of humility that come by having to work together as a family. L'chaim, in the second place, the blessedness of a life of more multi-dimensional, reformed faith and practice because of a more diverse cultural background. L'chaim, the blessedness of a life of more multidimensional, reformed faith and practice because of a more diverse cultural background. It's one of the things I love about the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. And people have commented on this. We often been defined more by what we're not. Well, we're not we're not really American Presbyterian, either Northern Presbyterian or Southern Presbyterian. We're not really Scottish Presbyterian. And we're not really Reformed like the Dutch are. But you see the elements of all of that in this one church that was blessed to have in its foundation a J. Gressa Machen, an R.B. Kuyper, a Ned Stonehouse, a Cornelius Van Til and a John Murray, and that's wonderful. And then even the prospect of having a fuller expression of the Dutch or continental tradition is a blessedness. It's the blessedness of a unity in which we're going to be honest, there's not going to be uniformity, but a uni unity nonetheless. But brothers and sisters, you think beyond that. One of the reasons I love ministering in New York, and I, and I have to, you know, I've had the privilege of, of preaching in, in Michigan, and, um, and I, I love when people are there for worship on time, morning and evening, they're attentive. It's good. Oh, God, the Tenth Commandment, you shall not covet. But, but, but I'll tell you what, I'll tell you what's really hard for me. They're all white. What a blessing to have a church where you have Hispanics and people from the Caribbean and blacks and Asians. And they don't know the OPC Book of Church Order. It doesn't come hardwired into them. You teach them, you disciple them. Wow, what, what aspects to the faith are brought to us when we have the humility to realize that there in different cultural traditions, we have the development of a more multi-dimensional reformed faith and 
practice. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to always be completely of one mind. If we're only going to be completely of one mind, it's just going to be you. And even then, you're going to have doubts about yourself. But there is a unity of one heart. I'm learning this as we're beginning now. I praise the Lord for this, to make inroads into the American black community. And boy, that's a hurdle in the OPC. Oh, what a hurdle, especially because of the music. But it's very interesting. These, the black couple I'm thinking of, very intelligent people. They've said, you know, we don't have anything like a, a Westminster Confession of Faith and catechisms in our tradition. But as we look back on the things that we've sung, we see so much of the same teaching. You see, you see what depth that brings, okay? Now, challenges, yes, but what a blessing. L'chaim to a life of more multidimensional reformed faith and practice because of a more diverse cultural background. L'chaim, l'chaim, to life, to the life of at least a little more visible unity in what to the modern world is a confusing mess. Split peas, OPC, PCA, ARP, KAPC. Let me tell you what the church is to our culture. You turn around your computer or your router, and what do you find in the back of these electronic devices, at least the desktops? If you have a desktop and you're not fully wireless, you have about 500 cords connected to all different ports and holes and areas and plugs, and it looks like a multicolored pile of spaghetti. And unless you are of a very rarefied, geeky type, you don't want to have anything to do with those cords. We're the geeks, folks, when it comes to our ecclesiastical spaghetti. And each of those cords is important. The world doesn't want to have anything to do with it. By this you'll know, they'll know that you're my disciples. If you have love one to another, you notice on the sheet, and this is amazing, I don't know that John Galbraith would ever excuse me for linking him up with Francis Schaeffer, but in Francis Schaeffer's outstanding book, The Mark of the Christian, Schaeffer writes, the world looks at Christians saying bitter things about other Christians, shrugs its shoulders, and turns away. It's not seen even the beginning of a living church in the midst of a dying culture. It's not seen the beginning of what Jesus indicates is the final apologetic. Observable, the final, not presuppositionalism, but observable oneness among true Christians who are truly brothers in Christ. Our sharp tongues, the lack of love between us, not the necessary statement of differences that may exist between true Christians. These the sharp tongues, the lack of love, which is giving yourself for the good of another. These are what properly trouble the world. And be honest, in most cases in here, it's affected your own children and grandchildren. Why so many differences? I'm quoting John Galbraith. We know that all believers are one in Christ, but the world does not. And we should make the body more perfect so that the world seeing the unity of the whole body of Christ may glorify the one who loved and redeemed them. John Galbraith is uh, still with us, 101 and a half years old, a father of the OPC and served for many years on the Committee on Ecumenicity and is a model of that kind of love and grace. And so L'chaim, to the life of at least a little more visible unity in what is a confusing mess to the modern world. L'chaim in the fourth place, the blessedness of a life 
of more efficient use of our resources in a time of increased expense and expertise for ministry. To use radio, to use television, to have good web pages, to know how to keep up with all the different platforms for communication is going to bankrupt small churches. One of our sons works with a company in North Carolina, and he is dealing with the company's um, acquisition of and merger with another company. I felt like, as he was explaining to me yesterday what it involved, that I was watching Jaws, the devouring of this smaller company. But here's the reason. A smaller company had isolated itself and it was spinning its wheels and wasting its money. And there were practical things that could be done without sacrificing any principles that could make it far more efficient. There's good lessons we can learn. The children of this age are shrewder in their generation than the children of light. Let's admit it, brothers and sisters, there's a lot of wasteful or prideful duplication of effort. Thank God for working on a Psalter hymnal and that our URC brothers didn't say, well, the OPC is doing it. We can do it better. Isn't that a beautiful example? No, sacrificing no principles, but benefiting both. Okay? And pooling resources. See, in the OPC, we have a model of this. In the 1950s, or the 1960s, um, the OPC had tremendous Christian education materials. We look at it now, it's kind of primitive, but for then it was terrific. We didn't have the money to produce it. Along comes the Presbyterian Church in America in the 1970s, and they got loads of people who need Sunday school literature, and P.S., lots of money to buy it. You know, one wag in the OPC commented at the PCA assembly, he said, you know, with, with the OPC's brains and your money, we could have a perfect church. <laughs> but they had the money, they had the people. And so over for many years now, the OPC has worked together with the PCA and this joint project called Great Commission Publications. Don't call it Great Commissions Publications. There's only one commission. But six boards of members of the PCA are on the Board of Trustees, six members of the OPC on the Board of Trustees. Now, do they wrestle through issues? Sure, I know, having served on that for many years. But the fruit of it is material that's not only been a benefit to the OPC and to the PCA, but other church bodies, such as, such as Brother Bill was alluding to, who are looking for good quality material. Well, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about here, Lachaim to the life of a more efficient use of our resources in a time of increased expense and expertise for ministry. Number five, Lachaim, to life. To a life of practical, observable love. Now listen, constrained by organizational union. I didn't just say a life of practical, observable love but a life of practical, observable love constrained by organizational union. What do you mean by that? The Orthodox Presbyterian Church, like the United Reformed Churches, struggles to get money for our various mission projects. We have tremendous individuals to serve as teachers, to serve as missionary associates and laborers, a lot more laborers than we have money for the laborers in the OPC. But organizationally, we are committed to these kinds of projects and home missions, foreign missions, short-term missions, and so on. It's exciting. People from other denominations come to the Orthodox Presbyterian congregations, and they have to raise their own support. And they're good people. They're very committed people. And you'd love to support them. And you feel guilty not doing it. But there's an organizational constraint that says, because I'm part of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, 
I must give priority to these. And that's right. That's the right thing to do. Brothers and sisters, wouldn't it be better to have a life of practical, observable love constrained by the organizational union in which we say, not URC, OPC, but whatever it would be called, this is part of this body of which we are one. Thankfully, it's a larger one than we had before, and we have a commitment to help them in hurricane relief, in their mission project in sending a team to help them work in the inner city. That organizational union, brothers and sisters, it's, it's very, it's gaseous to speak about practical, observable love. That, that's kind of, you know, it's warm and fuzzy and nice. That should be constrained by organizational union, in which in the same way I have a constraint to provide for my own family, even as I seek to help out others beyond it, we have an organizational constraint to help one another, even as we look beyond us. Number six, lachaim, to life, to a life that brings, oh, I love this, post-millennialists love this kind of stuff, to a life that brings a challenge to the devil. And brothers and sisters, you better get serious about dealing with the devil because his work is more and more apparent in our culture and what our missionaries see in places like the very darker areas of Africa we're going to begin seeing here soon. The devil sows the tares of, among other things, a wicked disunity. And true ecumenicity isn't meant to get in league with the devil. Too much false ecumenicity has done that but it's to fight him. You say, oh boy, this sounds a little bit charismatic. I've got to be careful. Turn with me to James chapter 3. Sorry, James, James chapter 3 and verse 13. Chapter 4 continues this with what causes quarrels and fights, but for our purposes, James 3, 13, who's wise and understanding among you by his good conduct? Let him show his works in the meekness, self-control under pressure of wisdom. In an ecumenical work, you need a lot of self-control under pressure. But if you have bitter jealousy and selfish ambition, my church, my heritage, my tradition, my background. If you have that in your hearts, don't boast and be false to the truth. This isn't the wisdom that comes down from above, but it's earthly, unspiritual, hello, demonic. For where jealousy and selfish ambition exist, there will be disorder and every vile practice. But the wisdom from above is first pure. Never forget that. It's biblical ecumenicity. It's principled ecumenicity. Then, peaceable, gentle, open to reason. There's a great phrase for reformed people. Open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And I think this is Psalm 133. And a harvest of righteousness, the life of righteousness, is sown in peace, in the, in the soil of peace, and with an attitude of peace, and with the seed of peace by those who make peace to a life that brings a challenge to the devil. And I mean it. Be honest. The devil gets a heyday when we're at one another's throats. Beware lest you bite and devour one another. So I submit to you with all these things. Don't forget. Give a good dash at the devil. Ah, Luther would be pleased with that. All right, then, very quickly, number six, Lachayim, life, to a life that is in a position to ask the very blessing he's commanded. Don't you love this? There he's commanded the blessing, life forevermore. And folks, how many of you are seeing loads of conversions in the churches that you're in? Come on, be honest. Ah, wonderful church growth. 
coming from the evangelical churches down the way because people have found out about the Reformed faith. What about converts? What about people converted from the worst forms of paganism and wickedness, witchcraft, knew it, whatever? Are you seeing those kinds of conversions? Maybe the next conference should be a prayer time asking that God bring those blessings of conversion. But I wonder out loud if God isn't calling us to this kind of ecumenical endeavor in our increasingly secular and relativistic postmodern culture. What do I mean by that? 1960s. With all the weaknesses, with all the sin, with all the problems, there were people who were raising serious questions about the plastic generation in the 1950s. It had this facade of Christianity. I mean, everyone was a Christian. The great evangelical revival of the 1950s when everybody went to church. You know why? If you didn't go to church or synagogue, you were a communist. And when you would ask the trenchant question to professing Christian parents, why? The best they could tell you is, well, you're going to be a good citizen this way. And is there, is there any reason that you can't understand why there wasn't in that generation a certain rebellion? And it was a culture that had its own, if I could put it this way, its own confessional standard. It's had its own, its own statements of what it believed. Most of these came out in their music. And they had their leaders that, that captivated them as they led. And they had their communities. And not a few of them became Christians. I'm suggesting to you that in our culture of decay, that's exactly what biblical ecumenicity does. It gives growing bodies of people with doctrinal standards expressed in different ways, not least through the music, and people who are led wisely and competently by godly leaders. Don't ever minimize that. Change in history comes, in most cases, by energized leaders and communities. Our culture needs that, as it did in the 60s, to a life that's in a position to ask the very blessing he's commanded. Lord, as we seek to see these things brought about in our, what we say and in what we sing and in how we worship and in how we gather, Lord, you've said you will bring the blessing of life forevermore here, and it will come. But not so long as we're stuck and provincialisms and ghettos. Number seven, l'chaim, to a life that sets an example to others and paves the way for further principled unions. I bet you've never thought about this. To a life that sets an example to others and paves the way for further principled unions. 1980s when I came into the OPC. Again, very agonizing time. Because my commitments are what would be known as old school Presbyterianism. Commitment to the doctrinal standards and so on. And I don't like being fast and loose with my practice. And this is one of the reasons why the OPC loves the URC. You are serious about these things. And there was at that time in the Orthodox Presbyterian Church a certain group under a certain name that will go unmentioned. And at least in the opinion of many, they were a little bit loose around the edges with uh, what those doctrinal standards and polity standards were, but they were active in evangelism and discipleship and church discipline. And the churches were growing under those names. And there were many who just criticized that as they led churches that were dying on the vine. Guess what compelled attention? It was those who, I love that old line that says, I like what we're doing wrong better than what you're not doing right. <laughs> they may have been doing some things wrong, but God was blessing their labors. And I thought from that, God, please raise up, and I believe he is doing that. And I think the URC is a good example of this. Raise up patterns, models of ministries faithful to the standards, second to none, that can be not only blessed of you, but used as models 
for other churches. Lachaim, the blessedness of a life that sets an example to others and paves the way for further principled unions. And I'm just going to add this. Neil, you'll be able to appreciate this as I do. It's going to take you younger men. Ross, you too. It's going to take you younger men to do it. Reformations never begin under the leadership of older men. They may encourage those reformations, as a Staupitz did with Luther. It's always the younger men and women who are the ones that really become the spark for biblical reformation. You're going to have to do this. And when you do it, say, Lord, not only bless what we do, but make, and this is why, brothers and sisters, never be pragmatic in any area of church life. What we do must be based on the principles of the Word of God, not least in ecumenicity, so that by the grace of God we might pave the way for further principled unions. What a great opportunity, L'chaim, to life. And finally, L'chaim, to life. I'm surprised this isn't in the forefront for us. To a life that honestly lives out of our eschatology. Ah, we love to say, the things of heaven are given to us in first fruits by the Holy Spirit. Ah, the already and the not yet realized eschatology. And the people in the pew say, what on earth are you talking about? Well, maybe the old hymn that says, heaven came down and glory filled my soul, says it better. Because that's exactly what our eschatology means individually and in churches. God takes a down payment of heaven and he puts it in you, in your children, the churches through which you're a part, classes, presbyteries, assemblies, and synods. If you do it right, that's what it's like. Psalm 133. If we live out of that truth that heaven is, as Jonathan Edwards says it is, a world of love. Pray tell, what does that mean for biblical ecumenicity? It means that we'll have the spirit of a John Kelvin in the handout that I've given you who says things like, I think it right for me, at whatever cost or of toil and trouble, to seek to obtain the object of this church unity. He wrote that to Thomas Cranmer. He said that he would do anything for that. I don't think that's a begrudging view of ecumenicity. I think it's the percolation of heaven itself in us that says we're going to do this. That's why I love the OPC statements that you can read about the obligation of ecumenicity. Look at, look at the one in your handout that would be on the, on the other side, the one from the, the OPC statement to the 12th General Assembly in 1945. Cooperation of the OPC with other truly reformed churches is not only possible, but obligatory. Our view of the church makes Cooperation among truly reformed churches, a solemn duty. It is no exaggeration to say that it, a church, is in sacred duty bound to seek not just visible, observable unity, but organic union with equally pure churches. Why? Because of the blessedness that comes. You know the old line, to dwell in love with the saints above, O oh, truly that will be glory. But to dwell below with the saints we know, now that's another story. That's the way most people think of ecumenicity. Far better. Matthew Henry, writing on Psalm 133, they that dwell in love not only dwell in God, but do already dwell in heaven. Listen again. They that dwell in love not only dwell in God, but do already dwell in heaven. As the perfection of love is the blessedness of heaven, 
So the sincere outworking of love is the earnest of that blessedness. Those who live and love and in peace shall have the God of love and peace with them now, and they shall be with him shortly, with him forever, in the world of endless love and peace. How good, then, is this unity, and how blessed. How I learned and will never, ever, ever, ever forget this unity. It was September 11th, 2001. At that time, I was on the board of Great Commission Publications, an ecumenical project, as I mentioned, with the OPC and the PCA. And for whatever reason, that board meeting at the Atlanta airport had been changed to noon. We did not need to leave early that morning. My original flight was 6, but it got changed to, I think, 9. 15 or 9.30 or something like that. And so I didn't need to be at LaGuardia Airport on September 11, 2001 until about quarter of nine. And I arrived there at 16 minutes of nine. Persnickety, I checked my watch. A time that will live in infamy. It was the very minute that the first tower of the World Trade Center was hit. It was obvious after getting in and having far less uh, onerous procedures to get right to the gate, it was Getting there, it was obvious something was wrong. And the way look, people at LaGuardia Airport, the some 3,000 people who were there at Central Terminal were informed, was really a masterpiece of orderliness. We told, were told that there was a communications problem at the World Trade Center, and we were to make our way out, and we did. And as we went out of Central Terminal on that absolutely crystal clear day that would rival anything Hollywood could come up with, we looked out over what was one tower basically eclipsing the other, but seeing the smoke curling out of both buildings. You couldn't get away from that site on September 11th. Bomb sniffing do dogs were in the parking lots, and I noticed as I looked out over the uh, Grand Central Parkway, obviously all the traffic to New York City was blocked, it was stopped, and there was no traffic the other way coming out toward Long Island. There were buses that were running to get people away from the airport to where the cars were, so we figured if we could get a rental car, we could at least make our way back to Long Island. And I will never, ever forget the sight on the bus going to the rental cars on the bridge over Grand Central Parkway, overlooking at just about that angle, the one remaining tower, and hearing on CBS radio when it was what was piped in that the tower was falling, and seeing that tower like a series of coins just falling in on itself, this massive gray banana peel-like plume of smoke. And in 15 seconds, what was the great, almost grandfatherly image of New York City was gone. One of the ladies that was with me was from Atlanta. She was to be on the same flight that I was in, knew nothing about Long Island, although she did have some relatives that lived nearby. She was with us. And I said, well, look, if you get a rental car, I'll take you to your place in Douglaston. That was, that was that place. I found out really what had happened. As we got in the line to get a car and began to, began to figure out something of what had happened here, we noticed in the threshold of a doorway in the uh, rental car place uh, a black girl who was curled up in almost like a fetal position, just wailing. So the girl, Barbara, who was with me, I said, Barbara, go, go find out what's wrong, see if we can be of some help to her. And uh, Barbara came back as I got in the car and said, well, she, uh, this is a girl from South Africa. She's never been to the United States before. She needed to get a connecting flight to Texas. She doesn't have much money, and she just doesn't know what to do. I said, okay, let's get her with us. She was comfortable because there was another woman in the car. We got her in the car, brought Barbara to Douglaston and then brought this just terrified lady, Natalie, home to our home. And it was at that time, because so little information had come out, people were wondering, was it a flight? Could they have been affected by it? And well, you can believe we sang Psalm 46 and we had family worship when we got back. That afternoon, we brought Natalie to some relatives of her on Long Island, uh, where she would eventually make her way to Texas. 
That night, at 9 o'clock, I received a telephone call from South Africa. It was from the grandmother of Natalie. She said, are you aware of Natalie's background? I said, well, I know it's trouble, but today I wasn't going to get into all of these things. And she'd had a very, very difficult and painful past. And it was under the influence of her grandparents that she got away from the very bad situation she was in, was gotten on a plane in which she would eventually make her way to live with Christian relatives in Texas. grandmother said, we have prayed that God would put our granddaughter in the way of faithful Christian ministers and Christians. What church are you from? Orthodox Presbyterian Church. They were from the Reformed Churches of South Africa, and at least knew of the OPC. Ten o'clock that night. Now this is, remember, when people around the world were thinking that given the fact that 2,700 people had been killed at the World Trade Center, or had been involved in, in the tragedy at the World Trade Center, that there would be lines and lines and lines and lines at all the waiting rooms of, of hospitals. But of course, that was not to be. 10 o'clock at night, I received a call from Jack Peterson, who was then the uh, I guess I call it executive secretary or whatever, the Committee on Ecumenicity and Interchurch Relations. Mr. Ecumenicity is Jack Peterson. If you wanted at that time to know anything about any Reformed church, any place in any part of the world, you'd ask Jack Peterson. Wanted to know how things were going. So they'd been praying for us. And he said, Bill, what kind of help do you need there? And I said, right now, we are just trying to assess the situation. There will be needs that we'll need down the line, but I'm not sure. And he said, here's the reason I call. The Home Front Organization, which is, I believe, led by lay people in Holland who have a database of skills and individuals willing to commit themselves or commit products or whatever it would be, they have a database of people from these various reformed churches in Holland, like the Article 31 churches, and they make themselves available to help out other people, particularly from reformed churches, when they know there's needs. He said, Bill, they've already gotten a list of doctors, of nurses, of medical equipment, and anything you need. How can they help? That, dear brothers and sisters, is why biblical ecumenicity is so blessed. I will never, ever forget it. Look, as we close at Dr. Godfrey's statement as he quotes J. Gresham Machen in the conclusion of Dr. Machen's book, Christianity and Liberalism. This is from Dr. Godfrey's article in Confident of Better Things. Um, commemorating the 75th and years, uh, 75th, 75 years of the OPC, his essay on the URC and the OPC. We may, says Dr. Godfrey, we must never forget that for Machen, the church ultimately should be a place of true biblical faith and fellowship above the battle. He wrote, that is Dr. Machen wrote, at the present time there's one longing of the human heart which is often forgotten, it's the deep, pathetic longing of the Christian for fellowship with his brethren. Is there no place of refreshing where a man can prepare for the battle of life? Is there no place where two or three can gather in Jesus' name to forget for the moment all those things that divide nation from nation and race from race, to forget human pride, to forget the passions of war, to forget the puzzling problems of industrial strife? and to unite in overflowing gratitude at the foot of the cross. Well, if there be such a place, 
And that's the house of God. And that, the gate of heaven. And from under the threshold of that house will go forth a river that will revive the weary world. Dr. Godfrey, it is confessional, reformed churches that can best fulfill this calling. And my prayer is that the URCNA and the OPC will find a way of doing that together. I trust that this conference might contribute to answering Dr. Godfrey's prayers, and I hope yours. Let's stand and let's pray. Our Lord, we don't know where to begin. We are so thrilled with this glorious picture you give in the Song of Ascents of people who've gone from strife and warfare and bitterness and division to a, a unity that is described so memorably. We can almost smell the fragrance of that unity. And yet at the same time, our Lord, we are so convicted of all of those things that mar and deface and that hinder and that prevent that unity, our own pride, our own selfishness, our own placing of our traditions above the Word of God, our own lack of humility, our own laziness, our own becoming so involved in our own little worlds that we forget, our Lord, that you, have made a, you are constituting a body and we're to seek to show the unity of it more. Our God, forgive us. We pray that in this last message as the capstone to the fore, we pray that all of these things we've learned about the biblical mandate for ecumenicity and the real, the real challenges that are before us and, and the way we can begin this on the local level might all be set into a holy flame as we realize the absolute blessedness that we do not have if we're not earnestly, zealously, pursuing a holy, observable, and even organizational unity among brothers and sisters, beginning with those of like confessional standards. Use this conference to bless us to these ends, bless our dinner conversations, we pray, that they would only be under the edification of one another. May our session this evening enable us to distill some of these things into more practical points, but, oh God, May we go forth from here imbued with the burden of our reformed fathers and forefathers that we will work hard, earnestly to pursue the unity of the Holy Spirit and the bond of the peace that comes from our great...